the Queen? Has she got a sniper rifle on a roof well, I mean, somewhere? What's going on? <laughs> Queen doesn't have it in her, does she? But she she jumped out of a do. helicopter with James Bond at the Olympics. <laughs> She's got previous, is all I'm saying. Apparently, Camilla, great in bed, according to this royal expert. What's your thoughts? Fateful night in 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 Paris. Yeah. Paris, yeah. City of love. She was rushing was through the Paris night. night. They hounded you, <laughs> you lost control. <laughs> we prayed that you would be all right. Hello and welcome back to episode 11 of Two Pals on a Pod. We're back. I've, al- I've let you turn up this week. I've let you come back on the show. It's nice, isn't it? <laughs> it's good to be back. I enjoyed last week's episode, but it's nice to be back in the in the hot seat, I feel. I feel like I'm going to get a ribbing this week. <laughs> well, this week we're going to be discussing the death of Princess Diana, our Diana, the people's princess. People's so princess. We're keeping the topics nice and relevant, just the 25 years old uh, this year so we are going to be discussing we've got lots of things to talk about you're obviously massively a diana sort of oh i love her Ooh, and all that <laughs> whereas i'm sort of indifferent as i am to most things um should we start like with the sort of fundamentals of what happened on that night that tragic night that fateful night in 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 paris yeah. paris yeah city of love not for her or maybe it was and that's the issue wasn't it i think she was rushing through the paris night, night. They hounded you, you <laughs> lost control. <laughs> we prayed that you would be all right. Um, anyway, the news did come through and she was body cold. She died in 1997 in a tunnel in Paris. When the, I think it was like an off-duty firefighter, came to uh, came to open the car door. She was in and out of consciousness, was Diana. And her last words were, oh my God, what's happened? And both backseat passengers were not wearing seat belts, her and Dodie. The front bodyguard was wearing a seatbelt. He survived. But for some reason, the driver wasn't wearing a seatbelt. Now, I always think that's a bit strange. Maybe it was a different time, 1997, for seatbelts. I don't know. I I can't imagine it was that different. But three out of four, not not wearing seatbelts. I'm not sure what the attitudes to road safety were in Paris. No. France. I'm not sure what the road safety protocols are in the royal family. But you'd think with somebody that would put such such a high price on her life that she'd she'd be safe. I think we know the reason, though, why the driver wasn't wearing a seatbelt, and that's because he was three times over the drink driving limit, wasn't he? Which I think says it's all careless. Well, supposedly. The French police claimed he was three times over the limit. That's that's what they were saying. Um, but then there does at least the question of, well, why is there only two drinks on the bill? There was a bill at the Ritz Hotel, only two drinks were found. I know, obviously, you can't handle your drink, but I imagine Henry Paul I mean, come on, two yeah. drinks, three it's, times it's on of, the limit. It's one of the more uh, curious things about this is the fact that, because he was an alcoholic as well, so he loved loved a Bev. But was Henry, he? Henri. I think, I think we, can't, we can't afford to question everything. There's got to be some truths in this case. I imagine he was a man of his age as well, a high-stress job, head of security <laughs> at the Ritz. Maybe he was. You just but made I that think up, the interesting. What, head of security at the Ritz? No, he no, no, you've just made up the fact that he was an alcoholic. In fact, if you listen to his friends, his friends said that he actually, like, drink no more than a normal person and he had in his room the french police failed when they went and raided his house essentially the french police failed to mention the fact that he had 240 cans of diet coke and only like a couple of bottles of spirits not exactly that unusual for a person to have a couple of bottles of well, i don't spirits. think his friends because i think the vibe was immediately after the crash he was going to be the scapegoat especially amongst the british media who's immediately the scapegoat for this i don't think his friends are going to come out and pile pile up on him and say yeah omri loved the drink especially just before he was about to act as a, sh- a chauffeur for the princess of wales so i think we can we can put them to to one side and i must add that diet coke is a fabulous mixer especially you can have rum and coke vodka coke you can have a whole range a whole range of drinks just the evidence of you know having the vodka coke and uh, the diet coke in the room means nothing i think it means nothing here uh, I don't think his friends are going to drag his name through the mud. But even then, I mean, if he wasn't drunk, if, if he wasn't drunk, it feeds into what I'm saying anyway about the fact that this is all kind of conspiracy. I mean, the rational thing would be the guy had a, you know, a few more drinks than he could handle and ended up smashing the car in the in the tunnel under the orders of MI6 and Prince Philip. So, so you think, you think Prince, Prince Philip and MI6 came together, hired Henri Paul, to not just kill himself, but everyone mm. else in the car. Well, it's important to remember as well that Omri Paul wasn't Dodi Alfayed's usual driver, correct? That is correct, but he was a friend That's of right. Dodi Fired, so why would he kill his friend? 
MI6 work in mysterious ways. <laughs> <laughs> they've got the power, they've got the influence. And Prince Philip as well. Prince Philip, have you ever seen Prince Philip? He's a very scary guy, isn't he? So I don't think they can't have been, if he's a scary guy. Were, I don't think they, they can't have been friends that close, I think. I mean, that's, I think that, that, that's what happened. I think that's what happened. I'd say that's what happened. But you've not really Personally. given us any information to back that up. So I'm, I'm sort of a little bit suspicious anyway. Well, um, they're, no, they're not going to leave a trail, are they? Not gonna, MI6 aren't going to come out and say, yeah, we did it, or a trail of evidence or whatever. If anything, I think it's very interesting. The most telling thing to me is that it happened in a tunnel, correct? So nobody could see. Also, CCTV was off. <laughs> so, little, so little evidence. But I mean, let's let's talk about the facts. Let's talk about the facts there. So the drive on Ripoll was, was not just uh, more than three times over the drink drive limit, supposedly, um, from the two autopsies that were done. But he was also on antidepressants as well, which obviously he's not supposed to drink on them. And uh, the staff said that he was drunk. The staff said that you could tell he was very much drunk. But then the CCTV footage. The CCTV. He, he appeared sober on the CCTV. He, bent, he was bending down tiny shoelaces going from one foot to the other that does seem like you know like i say you don't handle your drink particularly well i mean you would have fallen over in that situation if you'd had as many drinks as him listen i can't i can't tie my shoelaces at the best of times and i can't do a double knot um, <laughs> because i never went to scouts you're a child uh, so I yeah. because i think that that leaves me out of the equation i mean you think mi6 were in on it what's the motive yeah. for prince philip to take out diana and dodie five where's the, where's the motive <laughs> here from him where's the motive for i6 where's the motive for uh dodie fired's friend um, Henry Paul was the motive. What, what's you why? say, friend? How good? How good friends were they? Though at the end of the day, I mean, come on. If Prince Philip came to you and said, "Oh, I need you to do me a favor or whatever," I think you'd probably do it because he's a very scary guy. Just ask Prince Charles. But I think Prince Philip fundamentally disagreed with the fact that Diana was in a relationship with Dodie Fired for obvious reasons. I mean, you know what Prince Philip was like as well. I don't wish to speak ill of him as a as a as a dead man. Uh, that he is but I mean they have plans for the future as well like I said I mean they were certainly settling down together or whatever she'd had a few rough and ready kind of relationships uh previously hadn't she but she was ready to settle down with him and Prince Philip disagreed ideologically with her being with Dodie L5. What would it have why, why would it have anything to do with Prince Philip she's not part of the royal family anymore? No she's not but she's had two kids with Prince Charles future king of England and also do you not think it'd be more convenient to have her completely off the scene if he was going on to marry Camilla Parker Bowles, which everybody knew was going to happen, Diana included, knew it was going to happen, because she spoke about it on phone calls, phone calls that were recorded by MI6. I mean, she'd hear the clicker go off while they were recording her calls. She would hear the click of the MI6, presumably MI6. I mean, it could just be intelligence services in general, isn't it? So obviously, they, I get the, the view that they could have a general interest in what she was talking about on the phone. But it's interesting that, like, as you say, She's no longer a member of the royal family, so why are they keeping close tabs on her? Well, this is the thing. So we do know for a fact that MI6 did um, take some of her phone calls. I do think there was some paranoia from her, but maybe she had a right to be paranoid, given the fact that we did know that she had been taped. Uh, we also know that the American Secret Service had taped her as well, um, the mm. National Security Agency over there. So we do we know that. We know that she did get taped, and there was a lot of taping between various different parties, Prince Charles, Camilla, etc., had, had all been taped as well. Um, I just think... I, I don't buy the idea that Prince Philip would go, do you know what? I disagree with who she's sleeping with. I'm going to kill the mother of Prince William and Prince Harry. I'm going mm. to get rid of their mum so they don't have a mum for the rest <laughs> of their life as children. And I just because I don't like who she's sleeping with. I don't but buy he didn't it. Care, did he? At, at the funeral as well, he didn't care about the fact that neither Prince William nor Prince Harry wanted to walk behind the uh, the coffin at the funeral he didn't care he made them do it because of the to improve the image of the royal family simple as that that's why he did it he didn't think oh this will be good for them this is in their best interests to do this to walk just behind their mum's coffin as they're walking down whichever street it was in london in front of the nation didn't care about that it's all about optics it didn't look good for the royal family that she was out in africa shaking hands with people that had had AIDS, because at that point as well, there was a massive stigma around that. I mean, people in the 1980s, it was widespread in discourse in the 1980s, people denied that AIDS even existed. Now she comes along, member of the royal family, as she was at the time she was doing that. She's making strides, progressive strides towards recognizing HIV and how you can catch it. You can't catch it through handshake can you as we know as we know now mm -hmm. but back then it seemed like you know these these conspiracies ironically were flying around about it she did uh she's been progressive with the the landmans in africa as well speaking out against those 
So obviously it doesn't look good on the royal family, the conservative royal family that are essentially being made to look in comparison to her, like they're backwards, no? The optics aren't good. They're not good. So kill her in a car crash. Exactly. Exactly. Because she's doing a bit of of charity work, a bit of good work. They didn't want her getting her feet under the table with Dodie L. Fired because of who Dodie L. Fired was. And at that point, the royal family wanted to be seen as if they were untouchable, as if they were the perfect family or whatever, blah, blah, blah. It also didn't help that at the point at the time she was very open about the fact that she was bulimic, which is a mental health issue. They didn't like that. Didn't, didn't, they? Like, the landmines, didn't like the age, didn't like the Muslim boyfriend either. It's just this, these are all adding up. And also the fact that Prince Charles, for how long? They got married in what the early the early 80s, did Diana and Charles? 81. How long, how long do you think through their marriage? he was playing away with Camilla. Many, many, Diana many had lots times, say, yeah. Diana had a lot to say about that, and it doesn't reflect well on the future King of England if she's telling these stories and she's selling these stories to the press about how unfaithful he was. And she was unfaithful as well. And Possibly, it shows you that they weren't, they weren't willing to take it lying down because they also briefed against her and how she was unfaithful as well. So it wasn't, it's not as if the royal family are completely passive in this. So now, now that she's out of the royal family, we're going to kill our grandson's mother for the for audio yeah, listeners that's, that, that's him nodding his head she there. was, she, was <laughs> she was making them look terrible in comparison on social issues she was making them look backwards she was dragging prince charles through the mud because he'd been playing away having an affair for 10, 15, this, even, this was years after years. though. I mean, I'm not saying that these plans are easy to execute. I'm not saying that he <laughs> they divorced and he was Prince Philip was like, fine, let's kill her off then. I'm not saying it's that easy. I'm saying that there's a lot of coincidences in this, which I'm sure we'll go into as well. Coincidences in this that line up to a possibility of a conspiracy. Shall I say right, that? Okay. So let's let's move let's move things forward. So we, we don't want to go around in circles for too much. Let's let's progress things. Um there's a few letters that are involved here. There's one letter that yeah. Diana wrote. There's a letter that yeah. Prince Philip wrote to Diana saying that I don't know why Prince Charles would ever leave you. I don't know why anybody would ever leave you for Camilla. Uh, so there was some affection there from, from Prince Philip, uh, you know, prior to them breaking up. But there was also the note from from Princess Diana where she said, and I quote. This particular phase of my life is the most dangerous. My husband is planning an accident in my car, brake failure and serious head injury. What do you think? Well, this for me provides the cornerstone of the argument. This was October 1995. Mm -hmm. She's predicting her own death. It's there in black and white in the diary. And I mean, you can say, I've seen some people say, yeah, these diaries were an outlet for her to write in when she was feeling anxious or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I don't think anybody who's been anxious before has sat down at a diary and predicted their own death for it. You know, it became true. That's exactly what happened. There was an accident, brain injury, kind of accident, <laughs> dead. Simple, Stretch, simple, right? Simple as that. Simple as that. I mean, it was hard to say, but it was- I do think exactly. it's interesting. Your claim is that Prince Philip and MI6 planned this, yet, She's put, my husband is planning an accident. So which is it? Prince Charles, Prince Philip, MI6, all of them, the Queen? Has she got a sniper rifle on a roof well, I mean, somewhere? What's going on? <laughs> Diana, she knows what she's talking about. She's paranoid. It's definitely Philip. I don't think Charles will do anything. No, so I mean, it could be. She, she just got them confused. Um, Prince. It, could be, it could be any one of them. But the Queen, Queen doesn't have it in her. Does she, she wouldn't do She wouldn't do such a thing. She's too busy. She's actually got a role. These other dossers well, are just, they've got nothing to do. Prince Philip's got nothing to do. Prince she Charles jumped out of a helicopter with James Bond at the Olympics. <laughs> She's got previous, is all I'm saying. She's just sat there twiddling her thumbs with the corgis waiting for 007. Yeah. No, listen, it, it could have been, it could have been them both in cahoots. But one thing is for sure, the royal family were not happy with what she was doing and how she was doing it and who she was seeing. And she was dragging their name through the mud. There's the motive. Will a lot, a lot, a lot of coincidences on the night in Paris that don't add up. I think first and foremost, you're traveling with the bodyguard, with Dodie Alfired, and with Princess Diana. The Prince of was probably one of the most famous women on earth at that point. You have Henri Paul driving the car, who's not Dodie Alfired's driver. What's all that about? They might be mates. What's all about? I think that's very interesting. Well, it's because they've got the chauffeurs out at the front of them. It's the decoys. Why are the actual drivers in decoys? I just, I, for well, me, that doesn't make sense. 
They had to try and trick the press, didn't they? Because all the press are outside, loads and loads of press. And so had yes. it not been the chauffeurs that the press knew, knew know about, because they know the chauffeurs, had they seen do some they know, of the different... Do they know, do they, do they know the chauffeurs? They, they do. Chauffeurs they will know the chauffeurs' paparazzi, They uh, particularly when they're personal chauffeurs for these two people. So they will know them by face. So if they had, hadn't had put the chauffeurs in those cars, then they would have got suspicious. So they had to go yes. along with what the procedure would have been. But also they would know the decoy strategy then. The, well, they, they realised it eventually. Into, yeah. the, into the tunnel. So I think they're familiar with what goes on there as well. So I find it I find it absolutely bizarre that you would trust not some random. I mean, he was head of security at the Ritz. That's right. And is that that was that yeah. Was he was well. either head of security or deputy. I think something like that. Something like that. But it's not his job. Being a chauffeur is not his job. Paramedics. How long did it take them to get to the scene? They took the paramedics about six minutes to get to the scene, and there were two ambulances. Wow. But there were people on the scene pretty quickly. They were off duty, like firefighters um, firefighters yeah yeah that kind of thing so they crashed at 23 minutes past 12 by 1 a.m they removed her despite her not actually being trapped so it took them 37 minutes yeah. to remove her and then the ambulance doesn't leave for another 44 minutes so they've had they have her in the ambulance for 44 minutes they arrive at the hospital 22 minutes after the ambulance I think, departs i think all in all it took them one hour 40, something like that. One hour 43, get yeah. get her from the tunnel to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Usually that wouldn't take that long, would it? In a normal situation. I don't know what the confounding variables in this situation are, but normally all things considered, same situation happens again. It doesn't take them anywhere near to one hour 40 to do that, right? I do agree with that. And on paper, that does seem like an obvious thing of why has it taken so long? But actually what happens in France is different to what happens in the UK and America. So what ambulances do in France is if someone has low blood pr pressure, they stop yeah. the ambulance and sort and solve the problem because you know driving ambulance can cause issues in, in itself. So they, they stop the ambulance and they will treat the patient in the ambulance. Whereas here in the UK and US, you just get them as quickly as possible to the hospital. So they actually have a different policy on that. But experts did agree that her life could have been saved if not for the slow response. So there is exactly. an agreement on that. So that it, it did stop all, didn't they? twice. I don't know whether that was entirely necessary or not, or whether that was that was presumably in accordance with the procedure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the CCTV, what's all that about? Because this is Paris. This isn't some backwater, is it? You know, some rural area. This is the middle of Paris, no? Why is well, the CCTV turned off? I don't believe it's that beyond, uh, I, I don't think it's that unbelievable that CCTV would be off. I mean, if you think about, you know, like London, for example, it's got lots of CCTV in London, but it wouldn't be that beyond the realms of possibility for some of them not to be working. I do think it's unusual for all 16 not to be working, but the speed cameras, okay. the speed camera was working because that caught them. But the speed camera shows us nothing, does it, about what happened in the, in the tunnel? No. It shows us what happens just before the tunnel. Mm -hmm. So it's awfully convenient that the CCTV is turned off and the CCTV is the only thing that can show us what would actually happen inside the tunnel. So there, there's another two coincidences there. The CCTV is off and this accident happens in the tunnel. So nobody's actually sure what actually goes down, which mm -hmm. is another coincidence on top of the paramedic response time being ridiculously slow. And on top of, for me, I, was, I also can't get over the fact that they didn't have at least one or two of their actual drivers in the in the car with them how old was she when she married him she's ridiculously young as well Well, this is 18, interesting 19. she married at 19 but charles yeah. married uh, charles actually first saw her at 16 and he did an yeah. interview when they got married at 19 when she was 19 and he did an interview saying bearing in mind he would have been 28 when she was 16 yeah. He first saw her and said, oh, I, she came across very jolly and uh, she's very bubbly and a very attractive 16 year old <laughs> I imagine saying that now at 28, about a 16 year old. Pretty attractive. Imagine saying it, then. it was still illegal back then, wasn't it? But uh, well, not illegal. I suppose. No, morally abject. And I suppose Jimmy Savile was on the loose back then as well. So, I mean, standards have uh, he was. since then, which we have to we have to remember. It was 40 well. years ago. Um, but there were also moments throughout that marriage, all the way through that marriage, in interviews where they sat side by side. You can sense the tension, and sometimes they even like correct each other on camera that was just the start of it he was um physically attracted to her but he was always also attracted to camilla who was always on the scene and they that was a, that was a known secret wasn't it though camilla was always on the scene 
Well, this is interesting because I was, I've been watching a number of documentaries as I've prepared for this podcast. And one of them had a royal expert who commentated all about how, uh, you know, he obviously got with Camilla and that kind of thing, left, Di- left Diana. And she said, and she said it as if it was fact and as if she knows this for certain. <laughs> she said, oh, well, yes, it's, uh, it's well known Camilla was far better in the bedroom than Diana and sexually was um, was far more senior uh, because um, Diana was of course a virgin when she met Charles so you know uh, Camilla was far more senior in that regard and that's probably why he left uh, Diana for her so that's apparently Camilla great in bed according to this royal expert what's your thoughts yeah I think looking at her I wouldn't have guessed it um wow I imagine Ooh, we have a go I'm having a go and also I'm gonna have a go as well yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna have these royal experts and royal correspondents <laughs> give me a break. Can you imagine your life? Can you imagine going to uni and going to journalism school or whatever and having an established career in journalism for 20, 30, 40 years? What are you reporting on? The royal family? Like, I mean, Nicholas Witch or BBC, right? You know where I'm going with this. So they had a trial. Was that a trial? Hearing? It's a trial. Inquest. They? They a trial. Into the death of Diana. And all the correspondents that were reporting on it for the news were royal correspondents who make their careers out of blowing smoke up the arses of members of the royal family in order to keep them on side, in order to get the latest news, gossip, whatever. They spend their lives worshipping these people. You're not going to get a, um, a, you know, a royal correspondent who's in favour of a republic. I mean, it's not, not, not going to happen. And apparently, apparently from within the journalism court that were reporting on this inquest, all of the journalists had decided before the inquest even began what the verdict was going to be. Uh, supposedly, yeah. Nicholas, Nicholas Witchell of the BBC didn't even watch the inquest in detail. And yet he was out at 6, uh, 6 p.m. on the 6 o'clock news every night reporting on it. He just took that, uh, he took the verdict as a fait accompli, as a preordained fact. That's not unbiased reporting. I'm not saying they're active in the, the cover up of it. All I'm saying is that it's reminiscent of the attitude of the establishment in this scenario. They enable the cover up. If this, you know, if this conspiracy is true, then the media certainly enable a, a cover up of it because these royal correspondents that are reporting on this, on the death of Diana, rely on keeping jovial relations with the royal family i do think that's to sustain their livelihood. yeah i think i do think that's underappreciated because like you say they do genuinely have to you know keep good relationships and i think i think what's really un- under appreciated is the relationship between the royal family and the media there is a clear relationship like what there's a give and take there like for example if they want something kept out of the press and not reported on then in return they give journalists access to pictures of that thing kate and william have released some new pictures of them and their kids at easter we're going to give them to this paper (laughs) because they kept something out for us and it works like that there is that relationship going on and people i don't think always appreciate that that happens and also like you say they have a career as the royal journalists like if you're going to start slacking them off you're not going to have a career in that very often because you're not gonna be able to get the inside scoop are you so you know there is a little bit of that for sure um but I, i do think they were definitely they didn't even send like the criminal journalists out there. They sent purely royal ones, even purely though it was royal an inquest. All of them, yeah. yeah, I do think that sort of sets the uh, sets the precedent of of what they wanted to come out of it, which was a royal story as opposed to a criminal. And also, as well, the verdict of that inquest was unlawful killing, though. But I imagine you know a little bit about the, the wording of that. I think the documentary "Unlawful Killing," given the given the name of of what the juries came to, yeah. um, that sort of made it sound like unlawful killing means it was someone like the mi6 unlawful they were killed <laughs> with a sniper rifle or something like that and it's like it's not necessarily what the conclusion was the jurors came to the agreement that the crash was caused by or contributed to by speed and the driving of the mercedes speed and the driving of the following vehicles i.e presumably paparazzi and the impairment of the judgment of the mercedes driver on Paul through alcohol and nine out of the 12 jurors agreed to that and they also agreed to the fact all of them agreed all 12 of them agreed to the death of the deceased was caused or contributed by the fact they weren't wearing a seat belt and the fact the car struck the concrete pillar rather than something else they all agreed that without those factors they'd still be alive well it's fine that the um the kind of inclusion of the paparazzi in this is always an interesting one because once again it serves the purpose of giving the british public a scapegoat again so whether it's Henri paul the driver 
who from day dot was accused of being an alcoholic chain smoker um, who was this much over the limit or whatever whether that's true or not who knows don't smoke and drive kids but from day <laughs> from day dot that's how he was portrayed in the media as this lousy kind of french kind of you know drunkard no, who liked not. Diet Coke, so he's watching his figure as well, watching his figure, which is nice. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't matter, I'm dead. Well, but then also, the paparazzi were instigated in this as another scapegoat, weren't they? Because the story goes that the paparazzi were ferociously chasing this car through the Paris nights or whatever, and that's what caused it to crash. You know, the driver was completely sober, it was the paparazzi that caused it, and the flash from the cameras or whatever. Blah, blah. Are you telling me this is the first time ever that paparazzi have shot a moving car you know what I mean? Like, come on, the flash from the camera, it happens all the time, does it not? It's just another opportunity, I think, for a battering ram in this, this situation, you know, a scapegoat, the paparazzi. I mean... You don't think they uh, had the, any involvement? The, you, you disagree with the jury, uh, the juror's conclusion I, then? I, well, I think that their involvement is to the extent that they were there, they were chasing the car down, and it's, it's, a, it's a logical, very logical thing to say, oh, you know, their presence may or may not have caused a car crash. Right, fair enough. But when you're getting into the minutiae, but you know the flash from the cameras, um, you know, implicated the vision of the driver. Are you telling me that there's drivers out there that have had, you know, a camera flash in their face and they've crashed the car or whatever at 60 miles per hour? No, I mean, potentially, I can see the logic behind the idea that the reason he was going how far, 30 miles per hour over the speed limit, something yeah, like that. about that, yeah, was to get away from the paparazzi. Potentially, I can see that. But I don't think that's why he lost control of the car and, 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 and crashed. But there's no way of proving that. If only we had some CCTV images from within the tunnel. <laughs> see, I, I don't know. I'm not that sort of, um, I'm not that fussed about the whole CCTV thing. I, I don't think it's as much of a big deal, just on the basis that, you know, I wouldn't be the first time that CCTV cameras weren't working or speed cameras or something like that. It happens a lot in the UK. I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility that they might not be working or have not been serviced. You've got the, the theory of another car being in the tunnel at the same time because there's paint on the car of the, the, the Princess Diana was in. Theory, it's I a fact. <laughs> yeah, but the, the theory states that that, you know, has something to do with it. You know, it, it alludes to the fact that, oh, there's white paint on the side of the Mercedes. This must mean that there was another car in the tunnel that had something to do with it. There was MI6 or whoever. I don't believe that. I think it was just another card that happened to be in the tunnel but we don't know do so uh, where, um, where did the flash of the where did the flash of the camera come from then because there was a picture taken of them we know that it was paparazzi yeah Definitely. so you think you think that car was the paparazzi the white car i'm not sure what whether the white car was just another car that happened to be in front of the kind of melee that was ensuing or whether it was the car of somebody who was a member of the paparazzi or whatever blah 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 and I've got no doubt that the paparazzi are taking pictures because that's what they do. And that's where the flashes are coming from. What I don't believe is that the, the flash, you know, impaired the vision of Henri Paul, the driver, and that's why he crashed. I don't think that that's something that reasonably could happen. You don't think there's something suspicious about a car colliding in the tunnel or scraping? We won't say colliding. Collide, it wasn't as big of an impact as that. It was a scrape. No, because scrape. otherwise they'd have had to stop. Yeah, they scraped the car in the tunnel, presumably would have seen them crash, bang, in, in the rear view mirror. I mean, it was a big bang. You don't think it's that suspicious that they just kept driving? No, not particularly. I would. You would? I would. If I'd had a, you know, a stressful day, I'm working, you know, I'm living a life in Paris and I'm toiling away as an art designer or something, as I would out there probably, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm driving and I'm enjoying the sights. At way. midnight. And I hear a collision or whatever. They'll deal with it back there. I'm not having that. I mean, we're not. We're also not sure. I just keep on banging on about the fact that we're not sure about what happened in the tunnel, but we're not because 16 CCTV cameras happen to be off in the middle of Paris. I don't think there's enough evidence to suggest that someone's come along and gone, right, we're going to turn these off. MI6 are going to do a killing here tonight. We'll turn these off for the lads. And it, yeah, Go on. I just don't, I don't think there's enough evidence to suggest that. I just think it's coincidence at the moment that you're working on. Well, it is, isn't it? Because there's never really going to be concrete evidence with these things, not least now. Intelligence services are not going to leave a track, a you know, trail of breadcrumbs directing you to each and every clue or each and every possibility. That's not something that's going to happen. I'm just here just to remind people that there's a very intriguing argument, I think, to be made about what actually went on on that night on the basis of the context, which provides a motive, and on the basis of particular coincidences that happened on that night that were enabled to be covered up by the media. That's my kind of line of thought process. Here. I, don't... 
I, I don't think the motive's strong enough. I, I don't think the coincidences are particularly... I, I don't know, I'm not that enamoured by them, to be honest with you. I, I, one thing, mm. I, I do want to touch on a couple of different things. I don't think we'll touch on them for very long, because I'm, I'm, I think we're pretty much both in agreement here. Um, but people talk about being a pregnant and wanting to get married. I personally don't think that she was pregnant, and I don't think she was going to get married to him in the near future either. What do you think? So, so obviously she wasn't pregnant because they conducted tests on her and her hormones in the post-mortem that suggested she wasn't pregnant, right? But they also tested Henri Paul um, the levels of, was it alcohol in Henri Paul's blood or was it um, the carbon monoxide? Yeah, carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide that they tested twice and it brought back different readings. One was statistically significant in terms of impairment. The other wasn't. Very curious for me. I don't know whether that is a, an error or a mistake. Well, they took two readings or from different one, parts I'm of the sure body. Probably. So I don't know whether that makes a difference or not. I'm not really too sure. Um, but the, the sort of, basically the first reading came out as 20% carbon monoxide in the blood which would be ridiculous that i mean someone wouldn't be able to drive a car like that and i really could say he didn't drive the car very well so perhaps um but the other one came back as about 12.8 percent or something so averaged out about 16 yeah. percent or something like that which apparently is in line with a, a heavy smoker which only paul was so i don't know some people bring up the the sort of blood situation with the carbon monoxide as a big issue. I do think the, the first reading is very unusual to, for it to be 20%. They even said that yeah. in the inquest. It was very unusual. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's interesting. But taking these findings at face value with regards to Diana's post-mortem about the levels of the particular pregnancy hormone in the blood. Completely not, and even then, I think, you know, her friends would have definitely known if she was planning on getting pregnant again. And it probably would have been in the, in the diaries as well. And there's nothing that would allude to that. And, and then also, there's a particular quote... Um, uh, and also her friend, I mean, she went on a holiday with a friend 10 days before in Greece, just the two of them. And a friend says that Diana was on a period, so she can't have been pregnant. Fact, end yeah. of, job done. Yeah. So she wasn't pregnant. In terms of, of, of marriage, there is the kind of, I think it was Dodi Alfaya's dad, wasn't he? He said that, the, um, that he bought her a ring or something. But I think a few days before that, it might have been on the, on the holiday with the friend. I'm not sure where it was said and who it was said to, but she said... Um, it's a quote I think we can all relate to. She said, I need marriage like I need a rash on the face. And who can blame her after that marriage with Prince Charles, which was a bit, was a bit of a car crash, wasn't it? To, uh, In to Paris, use some, yeah. uh, City of Love. some interesting phraseology there. But yeah, no, no marriage, no babies on the way. But I do think that the royal family establishment in general probably has an issue with the fact that she was um, fraternising with Dodi Al-Fayed, I think, especially with the attitudes that they held back then. Um, the attitudes that they still hold today, I think. But I mean, you know, as we uncovered last year. But I mean, she'd been dating a number of people, a number of people that weren't white, uh, British. Yeah. She'd been dating a number of people beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I can't say that they'd have um, looked upon that particularly fondly either. Like, I'm not saying, oh, Diana's dating somebody that's not white, let's kill her up. Like, these things probably take time to, you know, if we're, if we're giving this kind of conspiracy you know, a bit Which of sport, are. shall we say. It's not kind of like Diana's ruffling a bit of feathers, let's offer. Like these things do take time to kind of <laughs> put into action, shall we say. It takes very long to turn off 16 cameras in a tunnel, shall I say. Yeah. So I, another another thing that I, I want to touch on, and it's coming from the same friend, a close friend of hers who went on holiday uh, 10 days before um, in Greece. And she mm. said something along the lines of, um, she, she's very much against the conspiracies. She said, I think it's because she was such, such an extraordinary woman that people struggled to come to terms with that she died in such an ordinary way that it's led people to, to think of these conspiracies in this way. And I think there's some truth in that, to be honest with you. She was obviously very well liked. I wasn't around at the time. She was knocking about us. And I wasn't going to be born for another two years, so it's difficult for me to get a flavour of you know <laughs> how well liked she was. But I do think there's some truth yeah. in the fact that she was so well liked and yet she died in such an ordinary way as a car crash. I think you have to just look at the public outpouring of grief at Buckingham Palace and at the royal residencies across the UK and all the, the masses of flowers outside. And Tony Blair's brilliant, the People's Princess speech on the morning of, which I think is amazing. Apparently he ad-libbed that as well. So, I mean, well done, well done, Tony. Well, that hit, you was that his words? breaking down in the street. Yeah, those were his words. Yeah, he, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he Tony Blair, but yeah, birth the people's princess. Yeah, and he mm. had a way with words. I mean, you can say anything about the multitude of sins he committed, but he was a good orator, Tony, <laughs> and that's that's all that matters. Sir Tony, even Sir Tony Blair. Ooh. 
Um, Not for much longer. You just have to <laughs> sign that petition. Yeah, you huh? just have to look at the public out <laughs> the public outpouring of grief at royal residencies across the UK, and the fact as well that the public basically and newspapers, tabloid newspapers anyway, basically had to beg the Queen, who was at Balmoral, to come down to Buckingham Palace to show some leadership as well. So there's a lot of emotion around this. I think there's a lot of emotion as well because obviously we never saw her get uh, get old. So she's in everybody's minds. She's always this kind of young princess, fun loving, you know, the um, the revenge dress, the little black um, revenge dress or whatever. Like that's what you think of when you think of Princess Diana. You think of somebody that took on the establishment after being fucked over by it. And I mean, that's the message I think everybody can, can get behind, whether you, you think that she died this way or that way. The public outpouring of grief, I think, was totally, totally reasonable. Reasonable. Mm, interesting. Um, back on back on to the the death i am i'm curious to talk a little bit more about this fiat uno which was supposedly yeah. seen that this white car that we know scraped into the mercedes uh, it's actually said by an expert let me find where what it exactly is said the scrape with this fiat uno would not have caused the crash and it's more likely that it was the drunk driver that caused the crash. So I think we can safely assume that, you know, the scrape wasn't enough to have, have caused that car crash. Um, but I do think it's interesting that the French didn't really pursue looking for it. Like they checked around Paris, but didn't expand it beyond Paris. And even still didn't come back with anything until I think independent journalists actually tried to track down a certain car. They found one car, which was from a journalist. It was in Paris who owned a Fiat Uno. And he had been taking pictures of Diana and Odie Fayed in the sort of weeks before when they were on holiday. And he'd also been bragging to friends that he was in the tunnel at the time of the crash. So it led some people to think, oh, is this guy behind, you know, the, the scrape? Is this the, the same car? But according to the French, forensics uh, checked the paint of both the cars and it was different. The paint was not the same. So it sort of ruled out it being that car, effectively. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? The fact that this Fiat Uno theory or whatever i'm not sure was it it must have been on the speed cameras or something or witness reports or something witness like that. yeah um this fiat uno kind of lead led people across france basically searching for this car and obviously you're right james somebody was a paparazzi who had a white fiat uno but it wasn't actually found to be to be his and then some random there's quite a funny little tidbit because there's this is a, it's a conspiracy theory that keeps on giving because it births more and more conspiracy theories the more you dig yeah as um, most conspiracy theories do yeah it's, it's a rabbit hole isn't it so you just keep on looking and looking and then i think you really take a step back and you realize okay maybe this this particular aspect is ridiculous or these particular aspects all of it well you can't lose sight of the the entirely rational conspiracies wow can you? I mean, coming from my coming from my tin four hat um <laughs> but there's this uh story uh that was in a french newspaper of this Vietnamese immigrant that had a white Fiat Uno and on the night of the crash, he's in around Paris, in around Paris. He matched the description of what the witnesses described to the police, the driver of the Fiat Uno. And the story goes that he drove all the way out to his local mechanic, back wherever he was from in, in, in France, not from, he wasn't, wasn't from Paris, woke the mechanic up in the middle of the night and ordered him to spray paint, it's like being GTA, ordered him to spray paint this white Fiat Uno red, which is, uh, it is, it, interesting something. why why pick um, red of all colors his, you know what i mean who, to, yeah, who took his car to the mechanic in the middle of the night wrote the mechanic up and said no questions asked can you spray paint this red instead of white just seem a bit of an apparently interesting one. according to the friend his name i've got it here lee van tan shout out to him shout out to lee if you're listening well he's living he's living a life of uh of solitude because he's he thought he got away with it didn't he, he thought you know what Spray paint the car red until two idiots on a podcast mention me by name. One. 25 years later. <laughs> 25 years later. And put my name right back into it. One, one thing I do want to talk about is the actual documentary itself, which you've based a lot of your information from. Um, yeah. Unlawful Killing documentary. It's important that people mm -hmm. know that the that documentary was uh, produced and funded by Dodi Fayed's dad. So it's yes. obviously going to have a certain angle. It's going to have mm. a certain set of perspectives. And I also wonder if his dad feels a little bit guilty because he arranged with Dodie to go, go down the, uh, basically have the, the two cars at the front as the dummy cars and then arrange for a third car to actually take Dodie and uh, Diana. So I wonder if he feels a little bit guilty about that and so consequently is trying to 
you know, make yourself a little bit better by coming up with alternative theories, perhaps. Yeah, I think it's a it's a, it's a bit of a, a reach, isn't it? That he'd be this he'd bang on this fervently about these uh, you know so called conspiracy theories just to clear his own name. I think it's just for me another case of an eccentric rich guy. He's the guy that owns Harrods, isn't he? An eccentric used to, used to own Harrods, used to own a um, Fulham football club. He was the guy that put a statue of Michael Jackson outside a football stadium. I think the guy is just a very <laughs> weird, just a, a very weird guy that was probably yeah, struggling with grief. I don't think guilt, I don't think he felt like he played any particular part in it. But obviously with these conspiracy documentaries, you do have to recognise that they do take a particular slant. And also they, they just, they do present an array of events and leave you to draw your own conclusions from them. And you shouldn't take all theories and all possibilities that are presented in documentaries as gospel. And a lot of the things that are presented in that documentary in particular are not mutually exclusive. I think it, you know it's akin just to throwing a load of darts at a dartboard and hoping one of them hits the bullseye type thing because some of the things that are absolutely ludicrous that are presented in that. And that's where you kind of lose people with these, with these theories, isn't it? Because you lose control of what you're saying and you start invoking the most ridiculous kind of people reasons for things happening. And also he changed his arguments a few times as well. So he, he has yeah. sort of chopped and changed various different things. And, uh, you know, he, he, for example, claimed that he wasn't involved in creating the dummy, the two sort of dummy cars at the front, whereas the bodyguards have, from day dot said, no, he was very much involved on the phone call with Dodie. He also said that Diana had told him personally that she was pregnant. I like, said that. Yeah, and that, that ultimately undermines a lot of what he says because you just can't trust yeah. him there because we know she was, and that's fact. But he claims yeah. that, no, Diana <clears throat> rang her up, rang him up and said, I'm pregnant. And maybe even mentioned being married as well, getting married or something. Yeah. He, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, because he, he said they were, yeah, were going to announce the marriage or something. Yeah, he, he said. said that... Um, he's. He said that Dodie bought Diana a ring in Monte Carlo, a wedding ring, an engagement ring. This guy... And I think it's hard for me to explain to people that don't particularly know him, haven't watched any of his interviews. He's absolutely off his rocker, isn't he? He's a, he's a classic kind of case of this eccentric Middle Eastern businessman that probably has too much money, right? Too much money and a whole lot of grief. The guy put a shrine to Diana and Dodi in Harrods. Just, you'd be going about your daily shop or whatever, or your Christmas shop in, in his back garden as well. In his back garden as well. And in, in the Harrods store, you'd be going around, the, you're, you're doing your shopping, minding your own business in the store, and then this would be there. You know, he adored them both to pieces and certainly adored Dodi to pieces, obviously his son. You're telling me that he wanted to cut corners on the, the security? I don't know. It, it does that, that would not add up to me, but I it's, think the, it's interesting that he wanted to arrange it himself as well. The thinking behind it was that it was only like two miles away or something like that. Uh, I do think it's unusual that not not just obviously Om Omri Paul being the, the guy that, uh, that ended up taking him in the car, but also he didn't go the di most direct route. He took a different route that you know took a little bit longer, whether that was to, again, because the paparazzi would have known where they were going, and so maybe he wanted to take a different road. You could argue that, but I do also think that's a little bit unusual as well, that he decided to take a different road that night. Uh, probably a result of the fact that he's once again not a driver. Yeah, there's that as well. Which I think well, it completely bewilders me. But there was a guy in the car as well. I don't think we mentioned this. The bodyguard, who mm -hmm. was the only one to survive, and he was the only one that was wearing the seatbelt. And it's, you know, Mohammed Al-Fayed said again, oh, he survived. He must have been in on it, which is completely ridiculous. But it's an often forgotten fact of the, the case that there was actually somebody there in the car that actually survived. He was in the front seat as well, wasn't he? And he actually survived the crash which people i often um forget about and also i don't think if you're going to be in on it you don't he literally had his face was like smashed in and so he had to have his entire face reconstructed for the sake of being in on it really no. i don't know he no. was also again i think pretty good friends with i can't remember if it was dodie or diana i don't know yeah one thing that i did want to mention uh, on diana's letter was that it was sat on for three years not literally by a police commissioner he sat on, now, just think, imagine if that letter was published straight after the crash, let's say. Imagine how the narrative changes then. The narrative would not be about Pavarazzi. The narrative would shift a lot. And then it was his replacement as police chief was then sat in it for a further three years. And both of them were then made lords, one in 2001, the other in 2005. 
and now Lord Stevens is now a chairman of a private investigations firm who's just had allegations last uh, in 2020, uh, allegations against them for bugging a billionaire's hotel room at the Ritz. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's all rather rather dodgy, isn't it? But also, as well, you've got to think as well. If we go back to the the inquiry, you know, just touching on the you know, you hinted towards it with the fact that they were both made lords, which is essentially using your your patronage or your patronage. Um, as a way that benefits you, you say that if you sit on this, we'll give you this, we'll give you this um, peerage, basically. You've got to remember as well that all members of the, as mentioned in the documentary, all members of the, the Queen's Council, QCs, take an oath to the Queen, to the, you know, to the matriarch of the royal family. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of their careers, you've got to, and, you know, it's touched on in a more contemporary way with Prince Andrew stuff going on now because there's no way in the present day that Prince Andrew would be able to be prosecuted if he committed those crimes here there's no way that he would be able to be prosecuted for those crimes in the UK and a similar uh, lens could be applied to this in the sense that how do you conduct an impartial as it should be investigation into these goings on that involve the royal family when the people that are involved have all sworn an oath of allegiance to the Queen who's the head of the royal family uh, it's a really, really anachronistic system, uh, I think. And it's just another way in which some people can kind of labour against the establishment and say that this isn't fair, because it's not, because it's not fair, is it? You know, you've got these people at this inquiry into her death, into Princess Diana's death, who are who have essentially sworn an oath of allegiance to the Queen. How are they meant to be impartial from then on? Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why I'm sort of against the whole sort of links between the royal family and, you know, too many parts of our sort of system, whether that be government system or, you know, legal system. I just think the idea of like a, a royal, is it a supreme royal court? It's the crown court, isn't it? Crown court. Crown just court. I, I don't well, like yeah. the idea of people having such a, a link to the royal family, because like you say, if Prince Andrew, for example, you know, in some sort of hypothetical scenario, was to commit a crime, for example, um, <laughs> then you know he wouldn't he wouldn't be prosecuted, would he? In this country, it just wouldn't happen under a, a crown court. So, you know, I, I don't like the idea of of having a family that's essentially above the law in that sense. And they can sort of, if they were to ever want to do, you know, some sort of crime, they could just get away with it because they so they yeah. technically own the courts. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's. When you look at a conspiracy, I think there's the, the context, you look for the motive, there's the actual act itself, and then there's the cover-up that ensues. And I think that in, in, in this case, the easiest part of this whole conspiracy, if it is true, is the cover-up, because you've got the legal system under your thumb, because they effectively serve you, and you've got the media under your thumb, because as we discussed, you've got the Royal Correspondents reporting on it, who's careers rely upon maintaining good relations with the royal family so i mean there's no contest is there really in terms of discussion in the public sphere about this may have happened and that may have happened there's no discussion whatsoever even documentaries that air commemorate i remember icv did a spate of documentaries for the 20th anniversary of diana's death in 2017 and barely any of them actually mention any kind of any kind of details that would even allude to a conspiracy or even a little tidbit about how long the paramedics took or whatever it's striking to see how things like that little details like that are erased from the record because these things have to be approved by senior people in the media no, not to get too kind of conspiracy mm-hmm. laid. Yeah, I, I do agree. Like, like I said, I'm definitely in agreement with the whole sort of the media are never really going to push that too much either. They're not exactly going to be like, oh, well, it could have been a conspiracy. It could have been the royal family because then that's just not going to go down well, the royal family. Did we mention about Henry Paul having links to MI6 and the French Secret Service? Did we mention that bit? No, no, no. Yeah, so it's interesting because he actually did have links both to MI6 and the Secret Service in France, which is quite unusual for a French person to work with MI6. But that is, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's like fairly confirmed. They did have links to MI6. So it doesn't necessarily mean he was involved in something here, but it is just interesting that he worked in both MI6 and the Secret Service in France. Somebody finding out about this little tidbit in his past that he worked with MI6 just serves to have fuels of the fire. It's just another interesting coincidence, an interesting coincidence that you would never find out about in in any kind of Diana documentary that is allowed to to mm, air, yeah, I think it's it's it's, it's really it's not a good look 
regardless of whether they're guilty, not guilty, whether they're involved, whether they weren't involved or whatever, to have a situation with as many coincidences as I've outlined. And I'm not somebody that's susceptible to believing this conspiracy and that conspiracy. Well. Or but this one, I think for me, there are a lot of things that line up in this that make sense to me. I think mm, I just don't think this, the motive for me just isn't strong enough. I don't think. But one thing that um, a paparazzi uh, said to um, uh, I think about Omri Paul is as he was entering the building, he, he was speaking to paparazzis, and I think he said something along the lines of, according to the paparazzi, uh, Omri Paul said, "You'll never catch us up." Or something like that. So he was having like a bit of uh, like banter with the, some of the paparazzi as he came in, apparently in, in somewhat of a drunk <clears throat> state is what they claimed. Um, but I think we should try and get to a point where we summarise exactly how we feel it went yeah. down that night. And we hmm. give our own sort of version of events of how we think it went down and why we yeah. think it went down like that. That'd be a good place to finish. So for me, I think there's no doubt that Henri Paul had a couple of drinks that night. That's not beyond the pale is it I mean, that's, that's fact has a couple of drinks he's driving the car for whatever reason he's not a driver but he's been drafted in to this situation he's been told to crash the car gets in the car proceeds to crash the car he's in on the plan from mi6 prince philip you know it's always funny to say that he was involved because he's a bit he was a bitter old man wasn't Henri paul gets in the car two drinks not drunk collision in the tunnel on purpose and I'm not sure whether the, the quickest route from A to B, from where they wanted to get to, involved the tunnel or whether he went out of his way to go into the tunnel. Who it didn't knows? involve That's the tunnel. Like no. that. didn't involve the t- another interesting tidbit. Amazing. I really feel like I'm building a case here. I the tunnel, think, collision. Think that strong. Your, your white car, your white car, not involved. Fatal collision. I don't think he was meant to die in the crash. I don't think that was meant to happen. Or if it was, at least he's got some money wired to him from, from MI6 for his family. Collision, bam. Somebody in the chain of command in the emergency services in France must be on it. A group of them must be on it. It does not take nearly two hours to make what is about a half an hour journey. And you've got your, your low blood pressure, those regulations. But I'm not, I'm not believing, I'm not believing that this woman's just been involved in a car crash, having a heart attack, and they're going, stop the ambulance, she's got low blood pressure. Like that's not for me something that seems vibe it's not something that seems logical i hope they've changed that regulation the motive for me is plain and clear she was making an absolute show of them simple as that so you think Um, he deliberately just swerved the car then in the tunnel or do you think he did it accidentally because he was drunk no he he swerved the car on purpose in the tunnel Mm. yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure on that but anyway uh here's my theory as to what happened i think what happened is they arranged for the dummy situation to happen. Two cars are out the front, buys them a little bit of time to get away from the paparazzi. The house is only about two miles away, so they didn't really need the usual chauffeur. You can drive two miles on what was essentially empty streets, according to um, most people that were there that night. So I think they thought, well, you, we'll do the dummy thing. We'll get a driver in. He's head of security. He's got a driver's license. We'll use the, the a rented car from the Ritz. I don't know. It seems a bit strange. Rented. A rented car, which was stolen three months prior and had its electricals ripped out and rewired. So perhaps maybe the seatbelts weren't working. Maybe that's why three of them weren't seatbelted. Who knows? <laughs> but I, I think, I, I don't think anything that suspicious about Henri Paul. Um, driving i think he's probably a little bit drunk a little bit tipsy i'm sort of happy with that not happy with him drink driving obviously but happy to say (laughs) i think he was drunk Uh, and i think if you actually look at the tunnel itself people tend to forget that there is a an arc sort of you arc left and go down and then sort of arc Mm. right at the same time so it's it is quite a steep drop i think what happened is he's driving along he's had a few drinks he's had a good time Diana and Dodie Fired were laughing in the back seat by the looks of it. Bodyguard yeah. looking a little bit worried. Diana was turned the other way, looking for paparazzi. Oh, have we got away from him? Oh, they're sort of giddy. We're on a bit of a chase. Oh, he's driving twice over the speed limit. This is fun. Uh, and then I think he's got a bit carried away, got a bit happy with himself. As he goes down into the tunnel, drunk, flashing lights, scrapes the side of the car. He's driving about 65 miles an hour. I think he then turned oversteers the car. To the right, I think he turns back into the concrete pillar and kills them. And I think that it was purely an accident because he was drunk. 
And I think there was, you know, the flashing of the paparazzi may have had an effect if you're, you know, drink driving, uh, may well have had an effect. And I think also the the steep decline into the tunnel could well have had an effect as well. And I think the ambulance turning up, two ambulances turning up within six minutes. I think personally, the reason why they took so long is because they were trying to stabilise her. I think... I'm a little bit suspicious as to why it took them so long to remove her from the car. That does seem odd Mm. to take 37 minutes when she wasn't trapped because the back of the car was undamaged. Um, But if she was in and out of consciousness, she had a heart attack, she went into cardiac arrest. And so they were trying to resuscitate her. They tried and tried to, I think they massaged her heart for like two hours at the hospital. So it wasn't through a lack of trying um, to try and get the circulation going. And they, they stopped the, the ambulance on the way to the hospital purely because it was a medical emergency. They had to pull over. Let's get a pump in again. Let's pump her up. Come on, pump her. Mouth to mouth or whatever. I bet there was a queue of people going, oh, I'll give her mouth to mouth. <laughs> I will. Mate. French kiss. Yeah, well, wee wee. So I think <laughs> they were probably queuing up. And I think that might, might have taken a bit of time. So they stopped a couple of times. I don't think that's too suspicious. Um, 22 minutes to get to a hospital three miles away on empty roads. A little bit suspicious, but a couple of stops, you know, try and get the heart going, whatever. And yeah, just a pure accident. That's the conclusion I've come to with a few sort of, oh, questionable things dropped yeah, a in few. There. There's, a, there's a few, isn't there? I mean, it's an accident in a tunnel that they didn't have to go through, driven in a car by a driver that they didn't usually have driving them. It was CCTV in the tunnel not working and a lacklustre paramedic response. All in all, it's exactly what she predicted would happen in October 1995 in that diary about a year before 18 months before when she was still technically married i mean i don't for me the motive i I keep saying that the motive is just not strong enough let's kill Mm. the mother of our grandsons i don't know it just it makes no sense i think it could be it could be argued couldn't it until the cows come home exactly Um, i think it's so interesting i've never seen such a conspiracy theory give birth to a conspiracy theory that gives birth to more more. every single point in this is basically contested it's like those russian dolls more just keep coming out i mean it's it's like that it is i'd like to hear people's opinions on this in the comment section on youtube actually what their thoughts are and also if they want to hear us talk about maybe the madeline mccann case at some point as well we can do one on that you know other conspiracies it's it's another conspiracy theory that i think holds the there's a decent amount to go off. It's not something like aliens and pyramids is it it's something that has happened more recently happened yeah that a lot of people do have some people have strong opinions about it as well and you know it's important to listen to all sides as well i think so if people do want us to do a a conspiracy podcast on that then just let us know in the comments just get get in touch get in touch with us and also if you want to join the 250 fraternity just hit the subscribe button as well we're we're getting there we've made some good strides towards that as well we have uh, that was good progress isn't it yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for for listening and watching Pleasure. this week. We'll be back. We'll do some relationship advice next week. I think we we've have uh, had quite a big podcast for this one. Um, so we'll do some relationship advice next time. If there's if there's somebody that needed relationship advice, it was poor Diana, wasn't it? Which is it a, a shame. But good point. She, she ended up the way she ended up. We we'll linked it back to the subject. Thank you so <laughs> much for listening and watching. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you very much. Oh. Get the fake glasses off.